My guest today is Ben M. Freeman. Ben is a Jewish author, activist, and educator, and he currently lives in Hong Kong, where he lectures university students on anti-Semitism. He is particularly vocal on social media in the fight against anti-Semitism, and in February 2021, Ben released his first book titled Jewish Pride, Rebuilding a People. Ben, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honoured. We're honoured to have you. Now, look, I... Um, I read the book. I really, really liked it. And in essence, for people who, who don't know what the book is about, what is it? What is the book about? Why did you write it? The book um, is an effort to help Jews reject the shame of Jew hatred. You know, one of the things that we talk about a lot within the Jewish community is, you know, the Shoah pogroms when Jews have been murdered, when Jewish lives have been stolen from us. What we don't speak about as much is the emotional or psychological trauma of those experiences or the shame that's imposed on us by the non-Jewish world. So absolutely one of the aims is to reject the shame of Jew hatred or the shame that is imposed on us through Jew hatred. And I guess the second would be to reject non-Jewish definitions of Jewish identity. And we see this, you know, all throughout history, the non-Jewish world attempting to define what it means to be Jewish. And because the non-Jewish worlds are in my opinion anyway, almost inherently hostile to Jews, those definitions, A, never accurate, accurately re represent our identity, and B, are always some kind of um, insult or they're demeaning. So it's really an effort to help Jews reclaim Jewish identity, to feel proud of their Jewishness, to see their Jewishness as a source of pride and never shame. Mm. Now, now you, you're actually a member of, of two uh, minority groups, namely being you are Jewish and you are gay. Yes. And you, you begin your book uh, by outlining this uh, a similarity between, between the Jewish and LGBTQ plus communities, which is this idea of passing, which I find very interesting. Could yeah. you explain to, to the listeners what does it mean to pass and how does this affect both communities? So passing is when a minority can be perceived as being a member of the majority. So in the case of LGBTQ plus people, it would mean an LGBTQ plus person being perceived as a heterosexual or a cis person. In terms of Jews, it's when we are perceived as being members of the often white Christian majority, or in other parts of the world, it could be part of another group, but it's always being part of the majority. And I think there's some people who see passing, being able to pass, as some kind of privilege because it is obviously different to not being able to hide your minority status right not being able to hide your difference but it is not a a privilege it's another manifestation of oppression so when i was a young teenager when i was in my teens i struggled with mental health issues i self-harmed i attempted suicide i mentioned that in the book and although i could pass as a heterosexual i was not privileged i was experiencing an enormous amount of pain of trauma, of shame inflicted upon me through a homophobic world. And it's the same when Jewish people are perceived as being part of the majority, our experiences are raised, what it means to be Jewish, the persecution that we've experienced. And of course, Jewish pride is about Jewish joy, but we're not going to forget the trauma that has been inflicted upon us and how that impacts us, it often impacts our day-to-day, -day, our lived experiences. So it completely erases that because it positions us as being part of the majority and therefore it um, imposes on us power, privilege, wealth often. And I think it also just misunderstands what it means to be a Jew. It misunderstands what it means to be Jew and then a Jew. And then it can also lead to situations where you have to reveal your Jewishness or your, your sexual orientation or your gender identity. And you can be perceived as trying to trick people because people think, well, you didn't tell me this from the beginning. And therefore, you've now played a trick in me. You're a trickster, which is often how Jews are perceived anyway. And then there's also the case that you can hear how people respond or feel about these minority groups without realizing that you're a member of them. So it is definitely a different experience than say the black community who cannot hide the minority status in the United States, but it is not a form of privilege and it can come with its own trauma, its own shame, its own fear, its own fear of being discovered. And I think that we, particularly in a post-Holocaust world, particularly from the 1960s, we have perceived Jew hatred to be a thing of the past. And it isn't. It's a part of all of our experiences. And that impacts Jews regardless of whether they pass or not. 
Yeah, I mean, this 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 idea of passing, I think it, it, it from my perspective, it, it mostly applies to Ashkenazi Jews, who a lot of people yeah. think, um, you know, a lot of people look at Ashkenazi Jews who mostly come from uh, Eastern Europe, and they'll think, oh, well, well, you're, you're, you're white. Yeah. And then you, you might try to explain, well, you're, they're not white, they're, mm. they're white passing. Mm. And I don't think a lot of people really get the difference. They might say, mm. oh, well, you still get the privileges of, of white people. Mm. So, so what's the difference? How would you explain what, what the difference is? Why does it matter? Well, the difference is the nuance. And I would also say it like, you know, we, we are in this habit of saying that basically the Ashkenazi Jews are kind of the white passing Jews. That's not necessarily the case. My, I know that I pass as white. My brother, who now lives in Israel, is also an Ashkenazi Jew and he doesn't. And I mm. think that there are many Ashkenazi Jews who do not pass and there's many Jews from other communities who do. So we have to, you know, it's obviously it's good to be specific. And I do specify in the, in the book about these different communities. But we, I guess we have to not make generalizations because there is this framing, even sometimes from within our own community of Ashkenazi Jews as say in inverted commas, the white Jews. I think the major difference is you know, we operate on a number, a number of different levels. So yes, absolutely, I can walk around and not be targeted because of the color of my skin. One thing I will say is that I can still be targeted for being a Jew. That is irrelevant. The color of my skin is irrelevant to that. I can also be targeted for being a gay man. And I think that we have to start looking at the complexities of, of advantage and disadvantage. And we often frame people as either privileged or oppressed and actually that's not the case it's it's often you know dependent on context if i'm walking mm. down the street with my same-sex partner we will not be attacked because the color of our skin my partner is white but we could be attacked for being a same-sex couple or because i wear a kippah every day i could be attacked for being another ethno-religious community an asian heterosexual person walking down the street with their differently sex partner could be attacked in the west let's say in america or Britain for not being white, but they wouldn't be attacked um, for being different, for being uh, heterosexual. And if they didn't have another ethno-religious marker, they wouldn't be attacked for that either. So in both of those moments, both couples are experiencing advantage and disadvantage. And I think the major nuance is really, it's about who you are. So mm. I'm a Jew, and yes, I might pass as white and I can move through the world in some situations as a white person if I'm not wearing my kippah. But what does that mean about Jewish experience? What does that mean about Jewish culture, about Jewish tradition, about Jewish civilization, about where the Jews originated, about how I can move through the world as a Jew? And I really believe yeah. that, you know, there is an advantage in the non-Jewish world to not being Jewish because of the way we are treated, often being Jewish is a handicap. And then we can get into this idea that we can change aspects of ourselves, right? We can change our names, we can change our noses, we can change our, our whole identity to be accepted. Trying so hard to be accepted is not acceptance. Mm. Trying so hard to be accepted is begging for acceptance, which in our case, let's be very clear, has never ever come really. We have very brief periods where it looks like it might be there, and then that illusion is shattered. So it's really about looking at the whole experience about what it means to be a Jew. And my Jewishness and my identity and my experience is not defined by the color of my skin. That obviously has an impact about how I move through the world. And I'm not gonna deny the advantage I might have, or I do have for being perceived as white. Absolutely, I have that advantage. But that advantage does not negate the very real prejudice that I experience. I'm sorry to say one more thing. This is a very long answer. I'm sorry to everyone listening. But one of the things that people have to really understand about Jew hatred is that it racializes Jews. It targets our bodies, our physicalities, just in the same way that it targets the bodies and physicalities of Asian people, of black people, of, of Native American people. You know, let's think about one of the main forms of Jew hatred, and I talk about this in the book. It's the racial libel. And it presents our physicality as something that's deformed and broken and ugly. And how does that impact real Jews? Well, it makes us get nose jobs. Mm. The fact that nose jobs are considered a rite of passage for Jews is horrifying. And, mm. and it's just accepted that, oh, Jews will do that to be accepted. If we have to change our physicality, if we have to go under the knife to change our faces to be accepted, that is not acceptance. And that's the nuance. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, now, you, you, you write how for many people, uh, I thought this was interesting. You write for how many people in the LGBTQ plus community, this aspect of your identity is often formed as 
uh, second to your prime, mm -hmm. as the backdrop to your primary yeah. identity, which in your case is uh, being Jewish. And you said this is because you're, you're raised to be Jewish from birth, but you won't discover your LGBTQ plus identity until later on. I'm wondering, how does this impact the way in which you exist in both communities? It's very interesting. I think I'm probably willing to forgive a lot more in the Jewish community because I was, you know, an out Jew for 20 years before I even discussed my sexual orientation. And that does mean something, right? It doesn't mean I'm more Jewish than gay. I am, you know, both. But it certainly means in terms of my identity, one is more prominent. That's not to say that's the case of every part of my life. When I came out, um, my my sexuality, my struggle with my sexuality was very much front in, front in my mind because I was dealing with it and my Jewishness did take a backseat. But I've always felt, I've always felt, I guess, part of the Jewish community where I don't really feel part of the LGBTQ plus community. And often that's because of Jew hatred. And while there is obviously LGBTQ plus phobia in the Jewish world, I... It's not that I'm more generous. Some people have said that I'm very generous to homophobic Jews. It's just that I see that we're kin regardless of their opinions. And we have a really deep connection, whereas my connection to the LGBTQ plus community is really just that we're attracted to the same people. So it is different. It's not to say it's less important. It's just different. And I will be very vocal about Jew hatred I receive or experience in the LGBTQ plus community. And again, I will in the, in the with regards to homophobia and the Jewish community, but I'm connected to those Jews, whether they like it or not, right? Whether I like it or not. There is a family unit, whereas I don't really feel that with the LGBTQ plus community. Although I have to say, some people do. So mm. it's different for every person. Yeah. Now, I was, I was, uh, I was surprised to read pleasantly, but it, it comes out in your book, you're kind of a history buff. I think that's, is yeah. that fair to say? Yeah. I'm a history You're, teacher. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I, I did not expect this uh, from your book. And there was a lot of stuff I didn't know. So it's very educational. And your book places this great importance on understanding the history of Jewish people. Um, and anyone who's into history will find this just another reason to enjoy this book. I really liked how you drew these comparisons of anti Semitic incidents that occurred thousands of years apart. Like one of my favorites. Uh, examples of this was your comparison of Paul the Apostle's letter to the Galatians, in which he stated that Jews represented the material world, to Karl Marx's assertion that Jews represented capitalism. These events happened just under 2,000 years apart. I want to know, uh, first off, how did you make this? Second, I want to know, why do you think it's so crucial that people have a, a good understanding, or a basic understanding of Jewish history when discussing anti-Semitism? It's really interesting you say that because that's always the way I've seen history. And it, for a while it made me feel a bit like a fraud because I, there are definitely things I have specific knowledge about. You know, I used to be a Holocaust educator. That is something I have a lot of knowledge about. But there are people who really, you know, spend years and years and years and decades of their life studying one event. And for me, while of course I spent a lot of time studying the, the Holocaust, I was always able to view history from kind of a bird's eye perspective and I don't know why that is it's just the way my mind works so for me that means I'm able to spot patterns and that is that's why I see it that way so that's why I can look at you know Paul and then Marx and then things that were said later on things that are said today and draw a connection and you know it's the same in my second book I can say that my second book is going to be released in October of this year it's going to focus on internalized anti-Jewishness and it's the second part of my Jewish pride trilogy. I'm turning it into a trilogy and it's the same thing. You know, I give one example from 2,300 years ago and then the last example is from today and I really see a common thread. And the reason that's so important is it tells us why. So much of the commentary on Jew hatred is just commentary. It's just people describing what happened. This person said this, that person said this. And for me, we have to get to the why. And the why is not going to be answered in 2022. It's going to be answered looking back in history to thousands of years ago. Because I always say to my students when I'm teaching, you know, my class on the Holocaust, I say the story of the Holocaust did not begin in 1933. It began thousands of years ago and it is still being written today. And that tells us why. We can then understand, okay, why are we perceived in this way? 
I did a Jewish studies class last term and I asked my students to identify one of the most, not the most, but one of the most significant moments in Jewish history and explain why. That was their kind of final essay. And a couple of the students selected the Christian accusation or the Roman accusation, excuse me, that the Jews killed Jesus. And they said that is something that kind of kicked this embedding of Jew hatred in Christian European society. That's one of the whys. So if we want to understand why do people say this about us? Why do people say that about us? And of course we want to know why. We can't just be like, okay, they say it, cool, right? No, we have to know why, because then that means we're able to understand it which means we're closer to being able to con- to combat it. And that is why really I see my work. My work is, is obviously through Jewish Pride is about inspiring, educating and empowering people. But I also want to provide people with frameworks. So I created or rather I didn't create this. I borrowed it, this um, idea from Harry Potter that the Jews are the Bogart of the non-Jewish world. So any of you non-Harry Potter, <laughs> which is not me because I'm obsessed with Harry Potter, um, the Bogart is a mythical creature or magical creature that no one knows what it looks like. And it takes the shape of whatever each individual fears most. So Elliot might be different for you than it is for me, right? And that is why we can appear in so many different forms to so many different people. So the left say we're not white. No, sorry, the left, yeah, the left say we're white. The right say we're not white. We're capitalists, we're communists, we're rich, we're poor, we're the intelligentsia, we're the uneducated, because we can appear in this way. And it is really vitally important that we understand why. Why are we perceived? Because it's not just theory. This is our lives. Why are our lives shaped? Because of these ideas. Where did these ideas come from? If, if, yeah, I mean, if, if someone is saying to you, look, I don't know the first thing about anti-Semitism. I know it's a problem, but how do I get my head around this? Where would you recommend they start other than your book, of course? Yeah, yes, of course. I'm going to plug myself. <laughs> oh, it's really hard. It's hard because what I want to do with my book is to create something accessible and fairly succinct. And I know that the chapter that deals with Jew hatred is long, but that is really as short as I could make it. Um, I, I think what people have to do is read history is not even necessarily read the theory, because once you have a little basic theory, like I do in chapter one, which is break it down into economic libel, blood libel, conspiracy fantasy, and the racial libel, then if you kind of understand those basic ideas, look into history, look Mm. at how we're perceived, look at how we have been treated, look at narratives that have come about that you might not even be aware are about Jews. So I think that's, I mean, I am obsessed with history and i think it is surprising to people because the first half of the book is very historical very theoretical and i think that people think it's going to be a lot more self-help and it does get there eventually but you have to understand the why we have to understand the theory the context and to do that we have to look at history um and i think you you know we start off with the basics look at the holocaust look at things that were said then and it's always then about going back in time because didn't start wherever you're studying. It started before that, before that, before that. Yeah. Now, as, as well as history, you also place a lot of emphasis on raising awareness of the different Jewish communities from around the world beyond the Ashkenazic European community, uh, you know, such as Sephardic, Mizrahi, uh, Beta, Israel, uh, Ethiopian Jews. You, you, make it a, you make it clear that persecution of Jewish people has happened and still happens to all Jewish groups across the world throughout time. One very good example of this, which you highlighted, is the Damascus blood libel in 1840. Why do you find it so important to understand how anti-Semitism affects different Jewish groups? Because it's very easy to pigeonhole something, right? To say, this is this problem. This only affects this type of Jew, and it's only perpetrated by this type of non-Jew. It's not true. The reality is in every single Jewish community, in every single Jewish experience, we see versions of the same thing cropping up. You know, if we look at the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions, they were cultural genocides, the forced conversions that took place before, and then they were ethnic cleansings. Have Jews been ethnically cleansed or have other communities been ethnically cleansed before? Absolutely they have. If we look at the Farhud, um, the pogrom which took place in Baghdad during the Second World War, which is a part of the Holocaust, you know, have Jews ever been targeted by pogroms before? Yes, they have. And understanding the commonality is so vitally important because there are differences, of course, between these communities. You know, the Safari Jews eat rice on Pesach and the Ashkenazi Jews don't. And the Mizrahi Jews eat this type of food and the Ethiopian Jews eat those types of food. 
And it is easy for us to kind of look at ourselves as separate. But in my opinion, those differences are superficial. Not to say that they're meaningless, they're culture. It's very, very important. But at our core, the identity is as one people, Amechad, and there are so many shared experiences. And it is important. You know, it's like studying the history. You have to know the whole mm. history. We're not going to just start, we're not going to arbitrarily pick a year and be like, this is the year we're going to start our historical study. So if you want to understand Jews, we cannot just understand Ashkenazi Jews or Sephardic. We have to understand the global Jewish experience because we all came from the same place. We all mm. were ethnically cleansed and we were forced to disperse. And then we had these incredible experiences, some of them terrible, but some of them wonderful. So I know I mentioned those superficial differences. And again, that was not to diminish the importance, the cultures, the individual cultures that were iterations of the original culture. But those, you know, those diverse cultures, the, the, the Sephardic, Mizrahi, Beit Yisrael, Ashkenazi, they're so beautiful. And it only enriches the Jewish community by experiencing all parts of of us it only enriches jewish pride you know my nieces and nephews live in israel and they are mixed ashkenazi and mizrahi so mm. they need to know what that what that means they need to know what their experiences were and be able to celebrate them and yeah. i think that is something all jews should know and it's not about prizing one over the other it's just about saying this is jewish experience so we have to understand what the jews of yemen were experiencing the jews of tunisia the jews of ethiopia belarus portugal because that is Jew that is a Jewish experience and that is our story. So I might be Ashkenazi, but the Sephardic, Mizrahi and Betty Israel stories are still my stories and the Ashkenazi stories are still their stories. Mm. Yeah, I, li I like that. Now, as, as well as as well as uh, history, you also talk about politics. And uh, at one point in your in your book, you you explore this notion of Jews being used as political football. What does that mean? It's a really fascinating notion where we see Jews or issues related to Jews being used to kind of cudgel your enemy. And this idea, again, unsurprisingly, has existed for a long time. In the fourth century, there was a Christian um, bishop, a Christian priest in, um, I'm going to say it wrong, I'm sure, Chrysanthemum. His name is John, John of Chrysanthemum. I'm 100% sure I'm butchering that. And he would call people Judaizers. He was saying, you're being a Jew to demonize them, right? You're spreading Jewishness. You're being like, you're behaving like a Jew. Now, of course, the one thing we have to understand, although I said that there's this common thread that connects all examples of Jew hate, one of my students described it really beautifully. It's the same soup, different bowl. So the core stays the same, but the bowl, the exterior, the outer expression can change because it always fits the zeitgeist. So today, people aren't always necessarily accusing people of being Jewish to, de to defame them. Sometimes that does happen, but sometimes it can be accusing people of being hate of, of hating Jews because a hatred of Jews is now associated with the Nazis and the Nazis are perceived as being kind of the ultimate evil. So if you say your enemy is a Jew hater, then you're comparing them to a Nazi really. And it's used really to demonize your enemy. And it has existed for a very long time. We see it in America on the left, on the right. We say, no, that person's anti-Jewish. No, that person's anti-Jewish. And most importantly, the person making the accusation is failing or refusing to investigate their own Jew hatred or Jew hatred from their own inverted commas side. And this is a real problem that we are often used by the non-Jewish world. That's one of the reasons Jew hatred became so embedded because we served a purpose or ideas of Jews served a purpose. So it's just an extension of that. And we see it a lot. We see it with the Democrats accusing the Republicans of being anti-Jewish, but we also see the Republicans calling out Democrats, but neither of them are looking at their own gardens. It's all just about talking about the other. And it's to score political points. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that Nazi comparison because this doesn't just permeate political groups. It permeates causes as well. And as we've seen in the past year or two years or whatever, um, the anti-lockdown groups or anti-vaccination groups, they will say um, our governments are, are Nazis for, for forcing these vaccinations. And I, I, I kind of think that's pretty disgusting as well. It's revolting. And that stems again from a historical kind of precedent. And it was the fact that the non-Jewish world, the Muslim world, the Christian world, used Jews to define their world. They used Jews to define reality. And they also positioned themselves against Jews. They defined their identity against Jews. So the Christians, the early Christians said, you keep kosher, we're not going to keep kosher. 
You circumcise, mm. we're not going to circumcise. Your material, we're heavenly. Your practical, we're spiritual. And this set in motion, this idea of using ideas of Jews to define identity. And we see that throughout time. We see people being accused of being a Jew. Um, we see people, we see Jews being used to define um, identity, even with Karl Marx. Karl Marx said that Christians have become Jews when they become capitalist, right? So that's using an idea of Jews to define what Karl Marx did not like. Mm. Today, because of the Shoah, it's very complicated because in some ways, Jews are perceived as being the ultimate victims because of the Shoah. But on another hand, and this is the whole point that these things can exist in one moment, on the other hand, the Holocaust is being de-Jewified and Jews are being perceived as the oppressor. So it is very complicated, but people think about the Shoah as the greatest, the Holocaust as the greatest crime in history. So if they're going to uh, position themselves as a victim, they're going to claim Jewish victimhood to define victimhood more generally. Um, and it's a very complicated thing. It seems very theoretical, but we see it play out. We see it with the anti-vaxxers. We see it with the anti-maskers. We see it with the vegans. We saw it with the Hong Kong protests. We see it all over the place. People say, this is like the Holocaust. And what they're saying is that we're like the Jews and you, whoever their enemies are, inverted commas, they're like the Nazis. But it's using us. It's appropriating our pain to make a point. Yeah. That's, that's an excellent point. Now, I want to I wanna read out an excerpt from your book. Um, you have this, this analogy that I, I really liked, uh, so much so that I wrote it down. And you, in, you have this analogy you use on your students that you call the cloud of anti-Semitism. So in the book, you write, for thousands of years, due to the ideological prevalence of anti-Judaism as one of the building blocks of Western civilization, the cloud of anti-Semitism has been drizzling anti-Semitism over multiple societies. It is constantly dampening people with Jew hatred. It may just stay on the surface of the skin and clothes of some people, while others absorb it until it becomes deeply embedded in their thoughts and perspectives. It is not always raining the same amount in all places. At different times, it can rain harder than others. Through critical thinking and a pursuit of the rational, some non-Jewish people develop an umbrella protecting them against this rain. Through education, we can spread knowledge which leads to individuals opening their own umbrellas. However, this is not the case for everyone. Sometimes it pours and most people get soaking wet, not realizing until it's too late. That's from your book. I really like it. What inspired this analogy? So I was teaching a class on the Holocaust maybe two or three years ago and my students just were not understanding. They were like, we, we know that people said the Jews killed Jesus. We know that people said the Jews are, are connected to money. We know all of this. <clears throat> Why was that said then thousands of years ago? Why did the Nazis say it? Because, you know, they didn't necessarily have the ability or the training to look at this bird's eye level. Um, and it was a way to, for me to help them understand how ideas are spread through generations. Because they would say, you know, I would say to them that, that line that the story of the Shoah did not begin in 1933, it began thousands of years ago, and it's still being written today. And they would say, but we're so different to the Nazis. And of course, they're right. So they couldn't necessarily understand why Jew hatred expressed by the Nazis is still a problem today, when they're not Nazis. The people they know are Nazis. Um, and it was a way to help them understand how these ideas are, are, are spread and how these tropes are continued because they're literally taught. We teach them. We, we show them in cartoons. We show them in films. And again, people are not even necessarily aware. And it, I, you know, a story that I tell in the book was I was um, about 13 years old and I was walking home with a friend past a row of shops in Glasgow. And the boy said to me, can I borrow money? And I was like, I don't have any money. And he was like, but you're Jewish. And that is obviously a deeply prejudiced thing to say, but he wasn't a racist. He was 13 years old. So he got that from somewhere. And we could say, yes, maybe his parents, I knew his parents, his parents were very nice. And it is possible, of course, they were saying these things. But these ideas are like in the ground we're standing on and they're spread over and over and over again. And we spread them. We, we perpetuate them without even realizing it. And that's why people express or experience microaggressions, right? Microaggressions specifically mean that the person has not intended to offend you or harm you. They just have expressed an idea which is prejudice. And I think it's really important, again, to help people understand why.
There yeah. is always a why. These things don't just happen. They haven't just appeared out of nowhere. We are living in a world which is which is a result of the world that came before us. So we have to understand that. And I've got to say that the idea was very helpful to the students. So that's why I put it in the book because I'm very lucky because I got to, I get to kind of test drive all of these ideas, these models. The Bogart was first used by my students in Hong Kong, and then when that's it works great. for them, I can bring it bring it in a book. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's the the first and best Harry Potter analogy we've had on the podcast. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's let's get to social media. You, you're very active on on social media, and you, you frequently speak out against anti-Semitism uh, on 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 Twitter you, and and Instagram. You are active on Instagram. You you've also spoken about how thanks to social media, you've been able to connect with Jews yeah. from across the world, which is lovely. How important is social media in the fight against anti-Semitism? Which platforms do you prefer and why? And what are social media companies doing to help or hinder this fight? I think social media is hugely important and we don't want to overstate it's important, but I think it is one of the front lines. And it's simply because it's a major form of communication. That's how people communicate. That's how people spread ideas, exchange ideas. It's how communities come together. So it's very important for us. You know, we're speaking on a very fancy platform. You're in London, I presume. I'm yeah. from Scotland, living in Hong Kong. We're connecting through the internet. So it's it's hugely beneficial. It's hugely helpful for us in, in kind of reforming this idea of Amechad, one people. It's also been used by those who hate us. And... You know, with social media, unfortunately, it is a numbers game. So Bella Hadid, who tweeted anti-Jewish things in May, she has more followers on Instagram, I believe, than there are Jews in the world. So that's a huge problem. So, we, you know, that kind of puts it in perspective how these ideas are being spread. And social media gives us a voice. I think that's so important. It gives us a voice as a community and it gives us a voice as individuals. And that was one of the most amazing things about the Corbyn experience was that we use social media to come together to advocate and we wouldn't stop talking. And, you know, we were being denied voices by kind of mainstream media. So we took to social media and it was really amazing. Um, of course, it, it has its negatives. As I said, Bella Hadid has more followers than there are Jews. So ideas are being spread beyond, um, beyond a way that we can really imagine. I think it's funny with regards to social media because all the platforms are slightly different. Um, Twitter is much more, I guess, intellectual. You have the academics, you have the journalists, you have people who are kind of really serious thinkers. Um, and that's how I got my start. I joined Twitter in 2018 and it was specifically to join the fight against Jeremy Corbyn. And my Instagram before was just selfies, pictures of my cat and kind of images of Hong Kong. It was not a work account. Um, and during the summer of 2020, kind of in response to the Black Lives Matter movement and things that were happening with that, I switched over to that as well. I didn't switch over, I used that as well. And that was very useful because it engaged a different type of audience. It engaged younger people. It allows you to say more. You're not limited to 280 characters. So I think that both are very useful. I think that Twitter is very toxic. I think that people forget how to speak to one another. You know, I saw a tweet today that was just so rude about someone and all they had said was something that this person had disagreed with and it's like it's okay you disagree with them you know and that's one of the dangers right that we lose this ability to dialogue and actually have a conversation but i do think twitter is and has been very useful instagram is there's many more for younger people tiktok snapchat i really don't know anything about them i know that tiktok is being utilized um, Clubhouse, I guess that was a form of social media that was being utilised for a bit. I think it is really helpful because I live in Hong Kong. I'm not surrounded by a Jewish community. My partner's not Jewish. So being on Twitter gave me a lifeline. It gave me Jewish pride. I got to connect with people all over the world. Jews like me who are having this similar thoughts, similar feelings, similar responses. Mm. Um, but it's difficult because it's a bit like the Wild West. It's not regulated. And mm. social media companies are trying. I did a training for facebook a few months ago that was very well received but it's very difficult because you're dealing with algorithm and you're dealing with volume and you're dealing with you know people who aren't necessarily equipped to kind of be deciding whether something is or isn't offensive which is why they need to speak to jewish people i know that the companies can do a lot better there's a lot of them we can name and we're not going to do that but a lot of them can be doing a lot better. And and simply they could just be engaging with Jews and asking, what do you need? And teach us. Because mm. one of the things we have to understand is that it's okay if someone doesn't know, it's not their fault, but they have to seek out 
knowledge, especially if they're in those positions of power. But I don't really know how you solve it. How do you regulate it? I don't really have an answer to that because it is like the Wild West. You Anyone can open a Twitter account and tweet at you the most horrendous things or tweet at you saying, go kill yourself. And you're like, not going to do that, but thanks for your input. <laughs> and you can block yeah. them. And then, of course, you can report people. But people always say to me, go report all those people. It's like, I don't have time to report thousands of people. <laughs> no. I've got a job. I'm busy. I've written a book. I'm writing another book. So I block people. But yeah, it's, uh, it, it is amazing on one hand and very terrible on the other hand. And I do think, you know, I said at the beginning, we shouldn't overstate its importance. And I just talked about how important it is. But I guess what I mean by that is we shouldn't start stop doing work that's really, that's really in depth. So continue educating writing books having conversations work that doesn't require us to you know stick to a 280 character limit i think that's really important as well we have to be looking at this from all angles and social media is the world we live in now so we have to utilize it yeah now let's get to your uh real life as it were you teach university students in hong kong about anti-semitism and the holocaust how did you end up doing this and, and what does a typical lesson plan look like also what's the reaction of the students to this so i also teach high school i teach both university and high school and i first moved to hong kong in 2015 because in 2012 i started a non-profit that worked with schools in scotland with regards to holocaust education and i have to say it was very successful but not financially. Uh, and I was really, I didn't have a salary for three years. I was sick of being broke. My phone was cut off. So I was like, no, I'm over this. So I just Googled Holocaust education jobs and one in Hong Kong came up. And I used to work for the Hong Kong Holocaust Intolerance Center. I did that for about a year. And then unfortunately my father was sick. So I had to return to the UK. And after he passed away, I moved back to Hong Kong. And the relationships I'd made when I was first here, they continued. So I continued speaking at universities and, and, and teaching classes at universities. And then I was just so fortunate to get a job at the Harbour School, which is a progressive, inclusive American international school. And they're so unbelievably supportive and they let me teach basically whatever I want. And I had a conversation I, the other day and the person was like, oh, so does your school have a Jewish studies department? It's like, no. I did they just let me teach it when I work at the universities it's generally in the European history department um or the Middle Eastern history department occasionally but in school they just let me teach the courses I want to teach so I taught last course a, a class on Jewish history called the story of the Jews I teach a biannual class on the holocaust and I think that the student I mean the feedback has been amazing and I think it's because I am so obsessed with it I'm so passionate and that is the best part of teaching is when you're sharing your passion with the students and yeah. helping them understand the world in a deeper way. And, you know, many of the students, I'd show them in the Holocaust class, I'd show them things that were said about Jews from thousands of years ago. And they're like, hey, that's not dissimilar to what the Nazis were saying. And, you know, it's an iteration of them. It's like, yeah, because it's almost like a true crime. Yeah. You've got to find the motive. You've got to find the why. And it's really, I've been very fortunate. All of my students have been open. All of my students have been curious. And I think they really enjoy how excited I get. I get, I started the class, the story of the Jews class. And I said, this is the greatest story you'll ever hear. And I was like, I know I'm biased. Like I understand that, <laughs> but it is. And I kind of repeated that throughout the class. And at the end, I was like, so I said this thing, what do you think? And you know, they weren't like, yes, it's the greatest, but they were like, this, this was an unbelievable story. Because that's what it is. It's storytelling. You know, the story of the Jews is, is ridiculous. It's absolutely incredible. And I'm very fortunate to have taught both Jewish and non-Jewish people. And I, you know, I, I, you know, teaching Jews is different because they kind of inherently get certain aspects of it. But helping non-Jews become allies, helping them discover, helping them learn, helping give, give them context yeah. is such a, I love it. I really love it. And I'm really lucky. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very clear that your, your passion kind of shines yeah. through. Now, it, it, look, it seems on one hand, the younger generations are better informed and better equipped to recognize anti-Semitism. But on the other hand, as you have pointed out in your book, anti-Semitism constantly evolves and adapts. As an educator, what is your, your prognosis for the future? Uh, I don't think it's good. Well, I guess it's two things. OK, let's talk about Jew hatred, right? I don't think it's good. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And then probably there will be a period of time where it gets less bad. 
and then it will come up again because it works in cycles. And there is this idea, and Martin Gilbert said this about the Mizraki and Sephardic Jews. He said, there's this notion that they experienced a golden age. They didn't experience a golden age. They experienced a period when they were treated less bad. So it's mm. bad and less bad. Um, that seems to be the kind of the way it is. And I do believe it's possible to change, but I'm going to give you another Harry Potter reference. I do apologize. Please. No, no, no. It's very welcome. Voldemort created Horcruxes. He killed people and split his soul into six or seven, right? Seven, I think, accidentally. And there was a conversation about whether he could ever put his soul back together. And they said, yes, he could put his soul back together, but he'd have to show remorse and the pain could kill him. And I think that's a really interesting idea, looking at why the non-Jewish world has never really made serious effort to deal with its Jew hatred. And I think that they'd have to really look so deep into themselves, think about the origins of their ideologies, the origins of their civilizations, and see what they've done to this harmless minority mm. of 15 million people and how they've persecuted us over and over and over and over again. And I don't know, while I think it's possible, I don't know if they ever will, because I think the pain for these societies could be too great. On the other hand, Jewish pride, the Jewish community. And I think the prognosis is very very healthy i think that we are entering into a time where we are reclaiming jewish identity where we're aware of the terrain we understand what the non-jewish world says about us but we're not going to let us not going to let it make us feel shame about ourselves we're reclaiming what it means to be a jew and we're exploring it and we're disagreeing which is really important we don't all have to agree but it's absolutely mm. incredible to see jews all over the world from all many different places, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, Mizrahi, Bet Israel, reclaiming their Jewish identity and saying really proudly, I am a Jew. So that prognosis is really healthy and wonderful and gives me an enormous amount of hope. Mm. Now, say someone comes up to you, uh, a Jewish person or a non-Jewish ally, they say, Ben, I really want to help in the fight against anti-Semitism. What do you tell them? Where do they start? First of all, do your homework. You have to understand it. One of the things I really love about Rachel Riley, and she has been very open about this, and she's one of the interviews in my book, I interview seven people, and she went away and did her homework. This is a real subject. It's not just something that people innately know. You know, there is definitely, people have connections to certain aspects. And I did say that when I teach Jews, there are certain things they just get, and that's absolutely true. But the history, the theory, the concepts, that's not just stuff that people innately know unless they have been taught, unless they have made the effort to learn. So the first thing is absolutely go and read, go and learn, spend time and be patient because it takes time to accrue knowledge. It takes time to be able to understand something fully, you know, so it's really important. That's the first thing, go and learn. And then once you feel that you're equipped with knowledge, start small, start in your immediate circle, start with your family, your friends, discussing these issues, talking about them. And then, you know, it's possible to go online, it's possible to form an, to join an organization, to raise your voice publicly. And that's also really wonderful. But the very first step is education. And there's many people out there who raise their voices and they've clearly not done their homework, but there's people who have, and you can really tell the difference because the way they understand it is just so, it's so different because it's not just about being able to name facts. It's not just about being able to discuss, you know, the Shoah or the pogroms or the Inquisition or the Farhood. Where it, you have to understand why yeah. and be able to track these patterns because we're not dealing with a modern phenomenon. We're dealing with a modern iteration of an ancient phenomenon. And it does require an element of historical literacy, which is, I'm obsessed with that. I'm obsessed with understanding the history because that makes me understand why. And that's the same for everyone. So the first thing is go and learn. Yeah. We're, uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up soon. Before we do, uh, I want to know your opinion as a Harry Potter fan. Re recently, this comes up yeah. time and time again. Recently, J.K. Rowling has been accused of anti-Semitism due to her depictions of goblins as bankers. What do you think about this? What's your take? So I understand why people make the connection, for sure. I'm not entirely sure that's where she was coming from. Neil Blair, who is her literary agent who runs the Neil Blair Partnership, or sorry, the Blair Partnership, he has recently said, no, it's not the case she's not anti-jewish and he is jewish so i think that's it's worth taking his opinion it's also worth recognizing that jk rowling was one of the few non-jewish celebrities to really stand with the jewish community during the corbin experience um 
So it's very complex. Who knows? Maybe it was rooted in, in some connection, but that doesn't mean that she's anti-Jewish. And again, this really misunderstands how this Jew hatred functions. The whole point of the cloud is that it reinforces these ideas and it socializes people into specific ways of thinking. I'm not saying that's what happened to J.K. Rowling, but even if it does, that doesn't mean that J.K. Rowling is a Jew hater, right? There is a mm. nuance there. And, you know, I understand why people make that comparison, but I also think that we have to also look at the proof that's in the pudding that she was an amazing ally to the community. And it's complex. I would really love to hear her perspective on it. Before we start, you know, throwing these labels around, I'd like to hear what her perspective is on on that connection because i understand why people make it right but there's also these swiss goblins in history that were goblins and they were swiss they were not jewish specifically and they also looked after the money so who knows right we have to be very we have to be very careful we have to be accurate basically is what i'm saying yeah now so your first book Jewish Pride Rebuilding People, that came out February 2021. It was great. I loved it, except for the bit where you said you didn't like pickles. I am Team Riley on I that one. I don't like pickles at but all. Anyways, no. Unforgivable. Uh, <laughs> what have you got coming up? You mentioned a trilogy. What's, what's happening with that? So I am turning Jewish Pride into a trilogy, just because I've got a lot to say, in all honesty. Um, the second one is going to be released by the same publishers, by No Pazaran Media, who are really amazing partners. And it's going to be released in October of this year, October 2022, and it's going to be focusing on internalized anti-Jewishness. Most people traditionally refer to that as self-hate. I'm rejecting that um, idea because I don't believe it's nuanced enough. And it's going to be, the book is going to be a similar structure. It's going to be, the first half is, is going to be historical, theoretical, um, you know, dense, I guess. And then the second half is going to be interviews with individuals who have made journeys to overcome their internalized anti-Jewishness. So I think that is going to be honestly a really groundbreaking study and investigation into this phenomenon that we still see described as rare. There was an article about Eric Zemmour, the French politician um, who's running for president, who is Jewish, and, and he's people describe him as having internalized anti-Jewishness. And the person wrote in the Jewish Chronicle, they said, oh, this phenomenon is rare. It's actually not rare, that's the point. It has many different iterations, many different manifestations, but it's incredibly common. So that is the second one, that'll be out in October. And the third one, I have titles, but I'm not gonna reveal them yet, just in case they change. And the third one is going to be a look at Jewish indigeneity. Because this is really, my work is about understanding Jewish identity, basically, and Jewish pride. And I believe a huge part of pride is knowing who you are and where you came from. So understanding that the Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel, looking at that, looking at our history, understanding what indigeneity means, and then understanding the kind of, uh, I guess, the consequences of that indigeneity on our, on our identity. Basically, that we're not just a religious group, that we're a people, a nation, a civilization, a culture, uh, an ethnicity, all of those things. So mm. that'll be the Jewish Pride Trilogy. I'm also working with uh, educational institutions like Plymouth University. I train their staff on being allies. I work with other, um, excuse me, private companies and educational institutions. I'm working with the Jim Henson Company, who are famous for making the Muppets on a couple of TV projects. I'm consulting. Oh, cool. So I'm very busy, but it's all really rooted in the same work is educating people about Jewish experience and helping them understand Jew hatred more. Yeah. Now, where, where can people find you? Well, if they want to see what you do, where can people find you? So you can buy the book. I'm going to start that. I'm going to plug that. That's available on Amazon, other good booksellers called Jewish Pride of Building of People. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. And my handles are at Ben M. Freeman. It's the same for both. You've got to have that M in there because there's too many Ben Freemans. It's too common. It's too too common a Jewish name. So I had to. They don't matter. Well, you know, I'm not even number one. If you type in Ben Freeman on the Google, it's certainly not me coming up. If you type in Ben M. Freeman, then I'm there. Um, and yeah, and I use social media. It's really interesting because I, in some ways, I, I definitely view my Twitter account and my Instagram account as part of my work. But it's mm. a way to give people a little bit of tasters into other things that I do and also to help inspire people. You know, I think people will read my post, look at my stories or, or see my posts on Instagram and they will be educated, they'll be inspired, they'll be empowered. Um, and I think hopefully it will make them feel supported in investigating their own identities. And this is one of the beautiful things about social media that I, I forgot to say earlier and I will say now is that it gives people direct access to people like me. 
you know, there's many great Jewish leaders and thinkers who are not accessible, who, and that's not necessarily their fault. They're from a different generation, perhaps. But, you know, mm. I'm a Jewish thinker of this generation and people message me and I respond to them. They ask me questions. They, they share their stories with me. And I think that relationship is really important. And it's one of the reasons, I guess, uh, my voice has been has been uh, embraced. And yeah. it's because I, it is emotional. That's why I always int include interviews in my work. We're not theory, we're real people. So we have to hear from real people and embrace real Jewish experience. Ben M. Freeman, thank you very much for coming on Podcast Against Antisemitism. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.